Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we dig beneath the surface of public reactions to police shootings in the U.S. and terrorist massacres in Paris. In the second half of our show, Emmanuel Martin, a French columnist and executive director at the Institute for Economic Studies, explains how French immigration law, labor policies, and welfare programs have combined to turn the country into a powder keg of suppressed rage. Up first, former Marine, police officer, and novelist Chris Hernandez talks about trauma, trigger warnings, and split-second decisions to shoot. Chris, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you, Bill. Good to be here. Chris, I stumbled on your blog a week or so ago and became transfixed by a post you titled Microaggressions, Trigger Warnings, and the New Meaning of Trauma. As a longtime cop, former Marine, and now the author of a series of novels depicting life in an infantry platoon, I found your voice so different I wanted to get you on the air to tell your story. Before we get into some of the issues you've raised, take a minute to describe your background. Okay. Well, uh, my background, I grew up in Texas pretty much from the time I was a little kid, I grew up hearing stories about my parents and my uncles and grandparents' service during World War II, Korea, Vietnam. So I wanted to be uh, in the military from the time I was very young. Mm. So growing up through high school, I was a kind of student who just really didn't care. I just wanted to get through it so I could get out and join the military. And uh, in my senior year of high school, I, I managed to uh, to even fail uh, family living, <laughs> like the easiest class anyone could possibly take. I, I was just, I don't care, I don't need to graduate, so I, I wound up failing out my senior year, and then went straight into the military. Uh, now, because of various different factors, including my parents begging me not to join the military, I wound up in the Marine Reserve. While I was in the Marine Reserve, I became a cop first working in a little bitty small town, Mm -hmm. um, then went to another slightly larger town, then went to a very large city. But after my time in the Marine Reserve, I went to the Army National Guard. While I was in the Army National Guard, I deployed to Iraq. That's been 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And I was on a convoy escort team there. And then uh, in 2009, I was in Afghanistan. And I was working mostly with the French Army. And that was serious combat? Uh, Yeah, yeah, there was... You know, not as much as some other people. You know, the guys who were, you know, for instance, you know, Kunar Province, those guys were in constant combat. I was in Kapisa Province in the Northeast, which was a fair amount of combat. There were some huge engagements. Yeah, there was there was plenty of action to keep you worried. And when did you muster out? I am actually still in. Ah. So you're still serving in the reserves, and, uh, and where are you a police officer? Uh, well, I'm still serving in the National Guard, and I, I'm i a police officer in a big city in Texas, but I don't say what city I work for because I do not represent the agency. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, so I, I work for a big city in Texas. Yeah, that's probably a good idea, particularly with your blogging and your, and your writing. So I'd like to get on to a piece you wrote that did attract my attention. Again, it's called Microaggressions, Trigger Warnings, and the New Meaning of, of Trauma. What motivated you to write that? I just happened to run across an article about a sit-in protest that happened at UCLA where graduate students went into a professor's class, a 79-year-old professor's class, Mm -hmm. sat down and stopped him from teaching the class because they were accusing him of microaggressing them and discriminating against them by correcting their grammar on their papers. (laughs) No. On its face, it was just such a ridiculous story. I had to look further into it. And according to one report, another report I read on it, the professor was actually fired. But the the students, it was an organization called Graduate Students of Color, were very offended and felt that this professor was oppressing them by expecting them to write in a grammatically correct fashion. Wow. Yeah, and it, that just led me to look into what is this nonsense? And of course, right along with microaggressions are the whole trigger warnings where people have been so traumatized in their lives that they think they should have a warning on content in colleges or in other places saying, this might remind you of past trauma. Now you can leave the room so you don't have to face it, which is is problematic on many levels. Yeah, well, you experience trauma and, and certainly work with people that had some real trauma. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, I've experienced trauma in, in, you know, and I mentioned some of it in my blog about some incidents that happened when I was a kid. Probably the worst one was uh, experiencing the suicide of my best friend when I was 10 years old. And yeah, that was, you know, that was a horrible experience. It took me a long time to get over. 
it was my responsibility to get past it. Of course, as a child, it was also my parents' responsibility to help me get past it. But it's not the rest of the world's responsibility to never remind me of it. Mm. But, you know, I, I went through some, you know, a couple of bad things growing up. Not not horrible. It wasn't bad childhood, but I had some bad things happen, just like what everyone else experiences. Yeah, but nothing compared to the military. Um. Well, you know, the military, that's kind of hard to, to judge, like, where on the spectrum what I experienced in the military would fall. When I was in Iraq, I was on convoy escort team, so my job was just we would escort supply convoys from base to base. And that involved generally driving hundreds of miles through enemy held territory overnight with all our headlights on, a string of 20 or 30 trucks, and basically you're just hoping you don't get blown up. Mm. And um, we got lucky. We got shot at sometimes. We never got hit. We had IEDs, you know, improvised explosive mm. devices, roadside bombs blow up in front of us and behind us, and we had a convoy on the other side of the highway from us get hit one night. I had a truck get blown up about 25 meters from me one night, but nothing specifically ever happened to me or my soldiers. Mm. So that was, ex- that was extremely stressful. I wouldn't call it traumatic, mm-hmm. but it was extremely stressful. In Afghanistan, you know, the Afghans like to fight. The Iraqis like to blow people up from a distance and run away. The Afghans like to fight. Hmm. We were in some big fights. One of those fights, tactically, it was a loss, and we lost some very good people. And you could say that was traumatic at a certain level, but as a soldier, it's just what you're expected to handle. And then actually, as a police officer, I know I've been in a lot of fights. I've been in a lot of chases. I've been in a lot of armed confrontations. I've been on a lot of murder scenes. Mm. I've been on a lot of accident scenes. Uh, as a police officer, I've never shot anyone. I've never even tried to shoot anyone. I've been in a shooting where a guy was pointing a gun at me, and as I'm trying to get the hell out of the way, someone else shot it. So I've had what I guess most would consider traumatic experiences as a police officer as well. And how have you dealt with your trauma differently, or some of the other soldiers you work with, how have they dealt with their trauma differently than these college students? Well, unfortunately, some of the soldiers, I would say, haven't dealt with it differently. What we're having on college campuses is you have people who are saying, I have something that's traumatized me, therefore I have to broadcast it, I have to demand that people change their behavior around me. And one interesting comment I got on my blog post, a woman giving all the justifications for why microaggressions exist and why it's so important, Mm -hmm. why trigger warnings are so important, and then she talks about being traumatized by seeing uh, pictures of thin women and having society tell her she should be thin. So now she has to hide the bathroom scale in her parents' house because she gets triggered by seeing it. <laughs> okay. That was like a perfect illustration of this This is ridiculous. That's not triggering a trauma. I, I'm sorry, there has to be an objective definition somewhere. Mm-hmm. So on college campuses, you seem to have a lot of college kids who are sort of weaponizing their trauma and saying, or what they call trauma, saying, I have a problem the rest of the world should change to accommodate me. But they're being trained that way. I would guess they're being trained that way, but I would also say that it's a character issue. That kind of training is not going to be appealing to somebody who doesn't already have some of that belief in them. Mm. So you could take any number of other people who would listen to that and say, that's ridiculous, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And you have other people embracing it. And how would you advise people to deal with their trauma? I'm really not qualified to give anyone any specific advice on how to deal with trauma. I'm just looking at the general principle Mm. that an individual's problems are the individual's responsibility. It's not society's responsibility to dance around what bothers anyone. So we're all going to be exposed to things that remind us of negative experiences. That's just life being around humans, you're going to see and hear things that may remind you of that experience in your past. It is your responsibility to come to terms with that. It's not society's responsibility to avoid bothering you. Well, those are words you don't hear very often. So, Chris, you wrote an interesting post about Ferguson, titled Ferguson, Idiot Cops and Experts Who Know Nothing at All. I I thought the lead was fantastic. Uh, Tell us a bit about that and share your experiences as a policeman. Well, the uh, the reason that I wrote that is, of course, after the Ferguson shooting, there was a huge uproar about what the officer should have done, and it was murder, and 
there's never a reason to shoot an unarmed person. And, oh, he shot him six times, and there's, that can't be justified. Mm. And it's frustrating to me as a police officer, not because I am, you know, the master tactician or anything like that. And as I said, I've never shot anyone as a cop. I've never even tried to. Mm. But there are obvious realities about lethal force encounters. When someone is trying to kill you, it is not like what you see on TV. If you ask your average person, where do you get your ideas mm -hmm. about what a gunfight is like, no one's going to tell you what I saw on TV. But when you see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of shootings throughout your life on television and in the movies, that is going to make an impression. Right. Now, on TV, somebody gets shot with a pistol, and they go flying through the air and spray of blood, and then they explode, and, you know, it's, it's an instant, immediate death from one pistol shot. And then in real life, as a police officer, I mean, I was on a scene where a teenage girl calls the police in the middle of the night to tell me her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend and her got into a fight. And about three minutes in, into the story, telling me about it, mentions, yeah, and then the girl shot me in the leg. You know, and I kind of had to take a step back and say, wait a minute. Yeah, you got a bullet now, in you? Right. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you just got shot in the leg? Yeah, just now. I looked down at her leg, and she's got a bullet wound through her thigh. And just standing there, she had just very little bleeding. It's not affecting her at all. It wasn't even important enough to mention until I was there for several minutes. That's the reality of shootings. Of course, you have times where somebody gets hit one time and maybe drops dead. Yes, but mm. in the vast majority of shootings, the initial bullets don't put people down. They don't immediately disable them. You've got uh, documented cases of police officers shooting people multiple times, inflicting fatal wounds, like non-survivable wounds, and, they keep and the coming. person still keeps fighting. Yeah. People don't get that if you shoot someone, because I guess your average person thinks, if I got shot, I would fall down and scream and cry and suck my thumb and all that stuff. Mm. But normally, humans don't do that, especially people who are accustomed to violence. If something hurts them, they don't immediately fold. They will keep fighting until they are physically unable to. And that's why I wrote that, to, to list all these documented incidents of where bullets don't do the things that people think they're supposed to. So what advice would you give to the public to help understand the stress that police officers are under when they have to make these split-second decisions? I think probably the, the easiest thing that people can do is look up the video from Fox 10 News in Arizona, Maricopa County, Arizona, where a local community leader, civil rights activist, he's one of the Black Lives Matter protesters, who I believe was a reverend, the local police board, Maricopa, Maricopa County Sheriff's Department invited him to go through force-on-force -force training, mm -hmm. and he accepted the invitation. Hmm. So they put him through three scenarios that were shoot, don't shoot. And in the first one, he didn't shoot when he probably should have, and he got shot. In the second one, he shot an unarmed suspect. And hmm. in the third one, he managed to not shoot the guy who wound up being armed, so good job on that one. He came out of it with a very different perspective, and he said, my advice now will be comply with the police officer. Even if you think he's wrong, comply and then handle the, handle it later yeah, on. Yeah, deal with it later. Exactly. Now, you know, a lot, I have a lot of respect for this, for the activist. He obviously is a very intelligent man. He's a very sincere man. He volunteered to go through the training and did publicly acknowledge the lessons learned from it. And anyone, I think, anyone who watches that, will probably have their eyes opened a little bit. Probably the frustrating thing, like when you're asking what should people do to learn, the frustrating thing is there are thousands upon thousands of things that can be easily found on the Internet to disprove people's presumptions about what shootings are like. Mm. All that information there is right there at people's fingertips, and no one, very few people are bothering to look it up. That's one of the reasons that I, made, I wrote that post and added all of those videos. These are not secret videos that you have to be a cop to find. These are all on the Internet. Well, it doesn't serve the purpose of the agitators to get those facts out there. That's true. I mean, it, it serves the agitators to continue pushing the myth, these different myths about what we're supposed to do and what the realities are. As a Hispanic American, what are your views on the role of racism in policing? I don't know that me being Hispanic is really, that that really forms any, any opinion specifically. 
my my experience, and, and I'm granting the possibility, maybe I just didn't grow up oppressed enough, and that's why I don't appreciate it. I don't know. Mm. Um, I, I grew up in a city with a whole lot of Hispanics, and there was a lot of intermarriages, and it was not, there was nothing unusual about the mixture of Hispanic and white and anyone else. It was normal. And as I've traveled around the country, being Hispanic, being obviously Hispanic, mm. to where I have a lot of Hispanic people, uh, especially people from Mexico, will walk up to me and speak Spanish, and they'll just assume that that's my first language. Mm-hmm. But traveling around the country, being Hispanic, I have not encountered the kind of systemic racism that people keep insisting is out there, and I haven't seen it in law enforcement either. Now, as a police officer, I've worked in two small towns, I've worked in a big city, plus I've worked as a United Nations police officer in Kosovo. Wow. And as a UN police officer, I was working with with cops from all over the United States, and I was working with police officers from 54 other countries. And at that level, uh, working with police officers from all across the United States, I did not see it. I mean, I worked with a whole bunch of Hispanic cops. Mm. I worked with white. I worked with black. I mean, there were there were officers from pretty much across the spectrum: Jewish officers, Native Americans, and we are so represented. I would I would even think that in law enforcement, in many agencies, minorities are overrepresented. And that's just my gut feeling because there's so many agencies that I've been a, been around have had a lot of minority officers, and it's not a big deal. At least in law enforcement, if you run across, like, oh, there's a Hispanic officer working over here, the the response is, like, so what? Did did he do his job? Yeah, what else is new? Exactly. The systemic racism that people are claiming is in law enforcement, I personally have not seen it. Obviously, there are going to be some agencies where it exists. Maybe there are some regions where it exists. I personally have not seen it. So, Chris, how did someone who practically dropped out of high school become an author of, of now two novels? I just got the idea. When I was in Afghanistan, I got the idea that, uh, hey, I have this kind of cool story I want to write. And I uh, started writing it while I was there. I actually started writing it in the plane on the way back to Afghanistan after leave. Mm-hmm. Wrote a little bit while I was there. And then when I came home, I just, in two months, I just kind of blurted out, vomited out this 200 plus thousand word story wow. which was far too long and I made a bunch of mistakes on uh, wound up splitting it up and part of what I cut out of that book became proof of our resolve which is a fictionalized account of an infantry platoon Texas National Guard infantry platoon in Afghanistan obviously informed by your experiences yes it's very much formed by my experiences but it, it is a fictional novel there, there are Things in there that are very close to home, and there are things in there that are completely fictionalized. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's, it is definitely not a memoir. It's, it's a novel. Mm-hmm. My experiences over there really drove me to, uh, maybe as a part of dealing with the stress or trauma, if someone wanted to call it that, uh, of wanting to get it out and, and try to convey to people the frustration of trying to fight that war. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, that war that's very different from what, from anything else we've experienced, and it was very different from the Iraq War, which a lot of people don't really understand. Give us a couple of examples. Well, as I said before, the, the Afghans like to fight. Iraq was very much, it was more frustrating in a certain way because you could never spot an enemy. Mm. In Iraq, I never saw an enemy, period. In Afghanistan, you would occasionally catch glimpses of the enemy as you're hitting. Uh, actually, when I was getting shot at, I almost never saw anything, but I did see the enemy at other times. And in uh, Afghanistan, the terrain was so restrictive. When you have the narrow valleys, you have the mountains that are extremely difficult to, mm-hmm. to climb. Uh, you have the villages, which are are basically built of individual fortresses that can withstand heavy machine gun fire and it is an incredibly difficult type of area to fight in unlike Iraq which is mostly open you know open deserts and things like a that. lot of opportunity for ambush a lot of surprise and and did the fighters melt into the civilians and make your job harder that way yes the uh, the Taliban will will just they'll shoot at us basically what would happen over and over with us is they would be shooting at us 
our helicopter would come in, and the enemy would just put their rifles down and go into one of their houses or just stand out in the open. Well, now they don't have their rifles, and they can't be engaged because they're not identified enemy anymore. They wouldn't go away. They wouldn't lose. Mm. They would just stop shooting at us and have to come back and deal with it again. So um, there's there's all these... I know a lot of civilians I've talked to have this idea that that our technology is so amazing; those guys just don't have a chance. And when I was when I was writing Proof of Our Resolve, one of uh, somebody who was critiquing one of the chapters where I talked about enemy. We knew enemy were in a certain valley, and she wrote a note: well, "If you if you know there's enemy there, why don't you just send a drone over to, to kill him?" And my reaction was: "Well, gosh, if only if only we had known it was that easy." Right. Right. Yeah. Well. The the fact is all that all that technology gets negated when we're fire when we're fighting a guy in sandals and a man dress with an AK who's going to shoot at us briefly and then hide his rifle. The you know an Apache can't necessarily spot that guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people think that it, it's you know, we have all this technology and so you know if we're not winning it's just because we don't have the will or something like that. But the reality is, it's just so difficult to identify targets. It's so difficult to engage, even when you identify it, because they're right there among the civilian population. And the rules of engagement are so restrictive, we can't use supporting arms in places where we need it, because it might hurt a civilian. Mm-hmm. So there, there's just many different things I think a lot of the public didn't appreciate about that war, and I was trying to get that across uh, in Proof of Our Resolve. Well, Chris, I thank you for being on the show, and I, and I look forward to reading your books. All right. Well, thank you. It's been good to be here. That was Chris Hernandez, author of Proof of Our Resolve and Line in the Valley, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. To send us comments and feedback on this or any of our past shows, visit realclearradio.org and click on the email bill link. Real Clear Radio Hour is a partnership with Real Clear Politics, which the New York Times has called an invaluable tool for anyone interested in politics or public affairs. Ahead, Emmanuel Martin Skypes in from France to examine the aftermath of the Charlie Hebdo massacre. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.